Hi, I'm Mark Nordenberg, the former chancellor of the University of Pittsburgh and now the chair of its Institute of Politics and the director of its Dick Thornburg Forum for Law and Public Policy. Uh, it is my great pleasure to welcome you to this Governing in Crisis interview series that is co-sponsored by the IOP, as we call it, uh, and the Thornburg Forum. Today we have a very special guest who is going to discuss a critically important topic, ensuring that our elections are fair and safe. Those of us who work with the Thornburg Forum are privileged to use the inspiring example of Governor Thornburg to champion the good governance values for which he stood uh, in the context of contemporary issues. There is a very substantial force in southeastern Pennsylvania, the other corner of the state, that has done a magnificent job of advancing that same cause. I refer to today's guest, the governor's son, David, who has built his own distinctive career of impact in the field of public policy and who has worked very effectively to promote principles of good governance. Among his many areas of expertise, David probably is the most knowledgeable Pennsylvanian when it comes to any questions involving elections. Uh, everyone is after him to speak on their programs or appear on their podcasts. And we have been lucky that we had a bit of an inside track uh, to get him to agree to speak with us today. David currently serves as the president and CEO of the Committee of 70, a nonpartisan organization headquartered in Philadelphia that has a rich legacy of more than a century of promoting good government uh, in Philadelphia and across the Commonwealth. As if that was not enough, David also is the founder and executive director of Draw the Lines, a nonpartisan organization that exists to slay the gerrymander. And if those two roles were not enough, David also served as the chair of the Pennsylvania Redistricting Reform Commission, uh, which delivered its report to the governor and legislative leaders a little bit more than a year ago in August of 2019. Before assuming his position with the Committee of 70, uh, David held positions of leadership with a number of other important organizations, including the Fells Institute of Government at the University of Pennsylvania, the Alliance for Regional Stewardship, the Economy League of Greater Philadelphia, and the Wharton Small Business Development Center. Uh, David, because the Committee of 70 may not have the name recognition that it deserves on this side of the state, uh, why don't you take a couple of minutes and tell us about the organization that you now lead? Sure, Mark. And before I do that, I just want to uh, convey my thanks to you for including me in this uh, in this wonderful series of programs, and uh, and and to you for your your terrific leadership of the of the Thornburg Forum and the IOP, uh, I found your programs riveting. Uh, of course, as you noted, I am a bit of a governance junkie. So, uh, but you're making an important contribution, and it's it's a real honor to be here uh, representing, uh, and I hope upholding my family's uh, values and and interests, and and to talk about a critical, critical set of issues today. So the Committee of 70, as you noted, uh, goes back a long ways. We're one of, probably one of the first so-called good government organizations in the country, founded during the height of the progressive era in Philadelphia. And there are similar organizations in um, Chicago and New York of about the same vintage, um, founded by a, a group of civic-minded business leaders uh, who were concerned about the quality of government and the quality of elections in Philadelphia and in Pennsylvania, 
and decided that it was their right and responsibility to do something as civic leaders to support and improve uh, and protect that process. And those are uh, all words that we take very seriously uh, and uh, have tried to execute around faithfully uh, over the years. And it means different things at different times. We've been very involved in promoting uh, campaign finance reform in, uh, in Philadelphia. Uh, we are constantly on the watch for lapses in integrity uh, and to, uh, to do our best to, to shame those who break the public trust uh, and are guilty of acts of, of corruption or malfeasance. Um, but there's, there's always been a strong current uh, running through our work uh, that's predicated on the notion that local democracy works best when more people get involved and more people are better informed about the process and their rights and responsibilities of, of citizens. So all of that I'm sure as you, as we play out this conversation will become evident if it isn't already, all of that comes to uh, a real head in this election season and uh, lots of, lots of things to, important things to, to talk about. One final thing about the Committee of 70, we have a curious name. Uh, we're, 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 we're proud of that. Uh, for those of your viewers who are uh, viewers of faith, uh, people of faith. Uh, the uh, the name is a biblical reference, actually. Uh, in the book of Numbers, it is noted uh, in the Bible that um, that the Lord uh, uh, was called upon by Moses as he was leading his people out of slavery to the promised land. And Moses, as leaders, uh, you know, can can be, was frustrated because his followers were complaining about the length of the journey. Are we there yet? It's hot. I'm tired. I don't want to go on. So Moses turned to the Lord and asked for help, and the Lord appointed literally a committee of 70 elders from the community to serve as sort of a kitchen cabinet. So I just wanted to clear up that mystery before we proceeded too far in the interview. Well, it is nice to know of that legacy. And I think it is important to uh, underscore the fact that the committee of 70 was founded by business leaders who felt they had a responsibility to be engaged as civic leaders. Uh, and uh, your membership and board today uh, reflect major employers within the uh, city of Philadelphia, which I think also is telling. Yep. For, for those of your viewers in Western Pennsylvania who know the reference, it's a little bit like the Allegheny Conference, the venerable leadership organization out there, solely focused on issues of of public policy and governance and, and free and fair elections. So uh, uh, I'm very proud of the legacy that I inherited and do my best to, when the time comes to pass it on to someone else in better shape than I found it. <laughs> well, voting sits, of course, at the heart of our de democracy. And I know it always has also been right at the center of the uh, Committee of 70's agenda. Uh, on your website, you say, we never endorse candidates, but we care very much about how elections are conducted. Uh, we have worked since 1904 for fair and clean elections to make voting easier uh, and to ensure your vote counts. Uh, on October 31st, 2019, Halloween of last year, uh, Governor Wolf signed what was called an historic election reform bill into law. Uh, I've seen photos of that signing ceremony and there you were lurking right behind the uh, governor. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about that bill uh, and what made it an historic reform bill? Sure. Little sidelight also to clear up a mystery. Lurking behind me is the Volkswagen, which is a little bit of the, the company car of the Committee of 70 uh, festooned with a really important message, which is that uh, we want to make sure we do everything we can to make sure that, that people's vote counts. Um, to, to your question, uh, it was a piece of landmark, landmark legislation. Um, much of Pennsylvania's rules of voting date back to 1937. 
So, and I say to people with a little bit of tongue in cheek, fortunately the world hasn't changed much since 1937, but it was in dramatic need of, of overhaul. And I credit the governor and the general assembly in stepping forward with a negotiated set of proposals to, to really um, advance things uh, uh, forward. Key elements of that, uh, one that we're quite aware of now is uh, opening of the op opening up the opportunity for all Pennsylvanians to vote by mail without the need for an elaborate uh, excuse. So uh, what's fascinating about this, and history will probably forget it, is that long before anyone knew the word COVID-19 or pandemic, the legislature and the General Assembly, again, in a bipartisan fashion, created this option for voters, which is now certainly coming into play. But there are also other pieces of that. Um, Probably the primary driver of the legislation was to provide state funding to counties to upgrade their uh, election apparatus, their election, uh, their voting machines uh, to make sure that they were as secure as they possibly could be, uh, given the context of swirling cyber terrorism around uh, elections. That was a very important step forward. And then there are other pieces that were all part of the package. A, a notable one is that it ended the ability of voters to vote so-called straight ticket, meaning in the old days and the, on the old machines, you could pull the big lever and vote for all Republicans, all Democrats uh, with, uh, with one uh, toggle of the switch. And, and that's no longer a, an option for Pennsylvania voters. But again, uh, I think it's a great advantage that this package of reforms was hammered out long before we ended into current circumstances, because I, I fear that if we had to do it under the gun, as it were, it, it, it might have been a very different outcome. But f credit, credit goes again to the, the governor and the General Assembly for coming to terms on that, on that package. What was the uh, policy foundation for the decision in that bill to eliminate the voters uh, ability to vote the straight ticket just by pulling one lever? Well, I suppose you could go back to a kind of a small d uh, democracy, uh, a theory of small d democracy, which is that voters uh, have a responsibility uh, to be, to be well-educated and well-informed and that uh, voting for each candidate one by one requires them to learn a little bit about who Susie Smith is or, uh, or Joe Jones uh, and, and not just blithely uh, uh, kind of pull the big lever. I, I think it also represents uh, a, a kind of a, a, a milestone in uh, how people's and voters' opinions of parties are changing. I think there's a lot of unhappiness with let's just say the vitriol that we often see coming out of the political parties. And this was a, a, a concession to that. So it, it, it was both saying um, you have a responsibility to learn about individual candidates, uh, but also we're hearing from you that you're unhappy with being, you know, kind of shoehorned into uh, this easy way of, of supporting the political party. So uh, and, and it's an unusual, I, I, we don't always understand in Pennsylvania how unusual and sometimes arcane uh, our way of doing things is. But this is, most states and municipalities uh, long ago abandoned uh, that, that mechanism. So in other words, it was about time. And you still can vote, all Democrats or all Republicans, you've just got to cast those votes one by one. Sure, you have to take uh, 10 seconds rather than one second. <laughs> uh, but it is interesting when you mentioned the, uh, the, the funding that was available under that bill uh, to support the efforts of counties to upgrade their voting equipment, uh, because you and I were a part of a Blue Ribbon Commission on uh, Election Security that was put together by uh, Dave Hickton and the Pitt Cyber Institute. And uh, our big concern then was the hacking uh, of the pieces of in-person voting equipment in ways that might throw an election into turmoil. Yep, uh, that, uh, that was an eye-opening experience for me. And 
and Dave Hickton and his staff did a great job of, of organizing that. But, um, you know, without being an alarmist, uh, you know, we live in a, in a big interconnected world where there are a lot of bad actors out there. And uh, we have to take a frank assessment of critical infrastructure like our voting system and make sure that we're doing everything to, to plug every gap that, that we can find. So I think that the commission's work did a, a, a great service to the Commonwealth and then the governor and the, uh, uh, and the legislature sort of picked up the ball and, uh, and kind of took it over the goal line. Well, you know, you pointed out that uh, the October 31st 2019 Reform Act uh, permitted uh, no excuse mail-in voting before anyone was aware that there might be uh, a challenge like the pandemic. Uh, you have said that you and your group are in favor of safe and fair elections. Uh, what do you think about the security of elections that are conducted by mail? Because we hear from the highest places frequently these days that mailed-in ballots are an invitation to widespread fraud. Yeah. How do you size that up? Well, let me, the shortcut, the short version of my response is I'll, I'll echo the thoughts and words of our second best former Republican governor uh, or Republican former governor, Tom Ridge, who's been very active uh, with a national organization called Vote Safe, making the point over and over and over again that voting by mail is safe. It's been around in this country since the Civil War. Uh, we have a number of states that have been doing this successfully for 20, 25 years. All the research uh, that has been uh, carried out over the years points out that the incidence of voter fraud in, uh, in mail voting is infinitesimally small. So, uh, you know, I, I second his opinion, and I think he's an important spokesperson to, to make that point. Um, this is new for Pennsylvania, and I think our challenge here is that um, the volume of voting by mail in the primary, and again, likely in the general, is... Um, on the order of 10, 15 times as great as it's ever been before. So it's, it's put a certain stress on the system, particularly at the, at the county level. And we have to recognize that. We have to um, walk into this process with the highest expectations, but also recognize that the stress this is putting on human beings, the, the men and women who work in, in county offices, the men and women who work at the polls, um, and I, I guess I would also, along, along those lines, remind people that those men and women, the folks that live down the street from us, the folks we worship with, the folks we, we see when we're walking their dogs, those are the folks that run elections. And my experience with them is they are terrific public servants. These are not partisan operatives. They're not sitting behind... The, the table at the election all day from 7 a.m. till 9 p.m. with some, some nefarious partisan insight. They just want to do the right job and a good job for their community and their neighbors and, and the democratic system. So if, you, if, if people start fanning the flames about, about fraud and spewing misinformation, just think about who's actually in charge uh, of running those elections and ask yourself, really, are those the people who are trying to spin this out of control for some, for some partisan gain? And I, I think the answer to that is clearly not. So apologies for the long answer, but this is a really important uh, issue as we approach this November election. And in fact, beyond the people who actually manage the voting process, uh, and I agree with you at each of the three polling places I have uh, had as my voting location here in Pittsburgh. I've come to be friends uh, with the uh, judges of election. And if I'm not there at seven o'clock in the morning, they start to get worried. The, but the other thing we've got going for us now, I believe, uh, is that there is tracing technology 
that didn't exist in the past that permits the Board of Elections to trace where ballots go and how they're returned. Am, am I right about that? No, you're absolutely right. And that's that's an important part to make. So we've got technology working for us that we didn't have, you know, just even 10 years ago. Um, I know in Allegheny County, in, in uh, the primary election, there were some news reports about voters receiving multiple mail ballots at the same address. And that created creating some concern that you know, if you got three mail ballots, you could mail them all in and they'd all count. Here's the catch to your point. Every voter has a unique uh, identifier that's, a, that's a, attached to that mail ballot. So you, you as an individual voter only get to count once. So that's important. However many ballots you, you get, you could turn them all back in, but only one will count. Only the first one counts. The, the second thing is the, the Department of State in the Commonwealth has a pretty good and simple way of uh, allowing people to track the progress of their ballot. If you give them your email address, you can go on at any point, you could do it right now, and, and check the status of your mail ballot. You can see when it was sent to you, when it was received, and when it got sort of the thumbs up that said, you know, this was formally counted. So, so there are safeguards uh, around some of the maybe uh, wilder uh, misinformation that, that's thrown out there. We did have something of a practice run with the primary, uh, and it is a primary that uh, left images in some of our minds that were uh, e at least embarrassing and perhaps unforgivable. Uh, Wisconsin, a state to which I have ties, uh, certainly fits into that category where there were people who wanted to vote standing out in the rain uh, with masks on their faces, trying to maintain social distance. Uh, it, it, to me, at least, it was a, uh, a picture of exactly what we don't want our democracy to be. Yeah. How did Pennsylvania do overall in the well, primary? We, we largely avoided those, uh, those kinds of scenarios, which were really almost tragic. Uh, but inspiring to a sense that when you see someone standing out in the rain in Wisconsin <laughs> in, in, in April or May or whatever it was, uh, that uh, is, a, is a testament to their commitment and, and persistence. But so, you know, Pennsylvania is a big and diverse county. You know, you go from uh, places like Forest County with 7,000 people to Philadelphia with a million and a half and Allegheny County with a million two or so forth. So it's a little... Anytime you make a statement about Pennsylvania overall, you have to qualify it. Uh, on average, I think we did fine, sort of a, an A for effort and maybe a, a B uh, for results, but it was a little ragged. And uh, I know in the southeast part of the state, uh, uh, Philadelphia was really challenged by the volume of, of mail ballots and it took them uh, much longer than they had in the past. Uh, to, to count and process those ballots. Uh, Delaware County, Montgomery County had similar incidents, and we talked about uh, Allegheny County's uh, 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 challenges. So uh, ragged, but the shortcomings were, uh, were human errors and, uh, and, and not at all the, um, the imprint or the impact of any kind of a nefarious partisan, partisan plot. Um, it's just these are, these are uh, simple and overloaded systems um, that did the best they could under the circumstances. But of course, uh, you know, we've got to uh, and are in the process of uh, trying to up our game to respond to the challenges of the November election. And, and to what extent uh, did people say the primary was a dry run uh, now let's get together quickly uh, and make changes so that uh, we're building on the lessons learned and November 3rd is even better. Yeah. Well, I think all of them did because this was such a new experience. But, you know, um, there's a term in the, in the mill, it comes out of the military that you do an after action report and an after action analysis. And I think one way, shape or form, all of the counties did that. They said, you know, what did we learn from this extraordinary experience of the primaries? 
and, and, and how do we apply that to the general? Where I remind people, likely twice as many people will be voting as in the primary. Not only that, but the increase of voters are more likely to be less frequent voters, maybe voters that haven't voted in four years. So there's a whole, the, the imperative to educate and inform and prepare voters and to prepare our systems is, is really daunting. But uh, all I know is, you know, again, the men and women who work in, in accounting offices are dedicated public servants and some of them are even now working 24-7 to, to get ready for the, the deluge of November 3rd. Well, on August 19th, you wrote a letter on behalf of the Committee of Seven Day uh, urging the General Assembly uh, to come back into session uh, and to address some additional uh, changes or reforms that you thought would improve the experience on November the 3rd. What were those things that you thought should be added? Sure. One is the counties needed more time and will need more time to uh, process their results. Um, the law as it now exists says the counties can't begin processing their uh, mail ballots until 7 a.m. of election day. Well, if you're in Philadelphia and you have 400,000 uh, applications to process and somebody expects you to get them all processed between 7 a.m. and 8 p.m. that evening. That's just not going to happen. So a key ask, I, I think a key imperative is that we give counties more room to, to process and more time to process uh, those applications. There's, there's another piece of this, which is that uh, counties uh, have a critical shortage of people working at the polls. Um, and Pennsylvania uh, uh, has a, a very restrictive rules about how counties can accept volunteers to staff those polls. Uh, and uh, a change that we felt uh, necessary was that, that we extend the time by which counties could essentially recruit new troops to work at the polls. Just by example, Philadelphia uh, in an average election needs about 8,500 poll workers. And um, it, right now, as of mid-September, probably has about 5,000 signed up. So you need fresh troops and you need more time to recruit and train those, those uh, fresh troops. I, I, I guess the, the final big ticket thing was, which is again still unresolved, is there was an overly restrictive deadline by the time, between the time where you could request a mail ballot and the time that it was due back in your county election office. Uh, Right now, the deadline for requesting a ballot is October 27th, and it has to be in the hands of election officials by 8 p.m. on Election Day, November 3rd. So call it six days, by which time you should both send your request, get a ballot back, and then return it to, uh, to the election officials. And, and that's even a finally... Uh, tuned, well-run, efficient, all hands on deck post office, um, that's not enough time to turn around uh, a ballot. So that was a, a critical piece of the request. But again, as of September 15th, um, those issues have not been addressed and um, we may just have to plunge on ahead and do the best we can. Well, it, it seems to me you can deal with that uh, latter issue in one of two ways. Uh, either you can make people who want to uh, vote by mail request their ballot earlier, uh, or you can extend the deadline for the uh, ballot to come in. Yep. Uh, what I don't understand is what is the objection to pre-counting the mail-in ballot, ballots, which your second favorite former two-term uh, Pennsylvania governor wrote in favor of in the last few days, or your proposal was even more modest than that, pre-canvassing yeah. Uh, yeah. the ballots, so you got them ready to count. How can anybody be opposed to that? Well, and by the way, I should explain, pre-canvassing, it's a fancy word, it's kind of an odd word, it literally means opening the envelope, opening the outer envelope, right? 
it's just, it's like a, an administrative task. I think there was an inordinate fear that somehow results would start to leak out from various counties that might influence the election. And I don't think that's a, that's a credible scenario, but let's just acknowledge we're in a, in a white hot uh, presidential race. Uh, also, you know, uh, legislative races and statewide races. Politics is a, is a fierce contact sport and you get within six weeks of the election and everybody's looking for every conceivable angle they can find. But I think it's, it's, you know, we're firm believers, and I, I suspect I get no argument with you, that um, all of this is about the integrity and the efficiency and effectiveness of the process. It's not about the outcome. And people have to have confidence in the process. And we got to get it right. And we got to provide the resources and the leadership and the management to get it right. But those words, noble as they are, uh, sometimes fall on deaf ears when you put them into the mix master of the political process. Well, and you have uh, expressed the uh, worry that November 3rd uh, may turn into a somewhat messy process day. So what words of advice would you have to individual citizens who want to avoid the mess and make certain that their vote does count? Sure. Well, one is uh, another solution to the timing problem that we mentioned earlier around mail ballots. And here's an easy way to deal with that. Do it early. <laughs> uh, I, I say to people, there are, there are three critical numbers in this election season, 19, 27, and 3. October 19th is the last day to register. You can register online. So that was pretty straightforward. October 27th, as I noted, is the last day to request a mail ballot. But the real answer to that is today. Request a ballot today because you'll get it as soon as it's ready and then you'll have plenty of time for the post office to bring it back or, or what have you. And then of course, November 3rd is the election. So I, I encourage people to think of this election process as it's as if, you know, if you were applying for a job that you really wanted, um, you'd take your time, you'd learn about the job, you'd make sure there were not, no typos on your resume, you'd make sure you handed it to the, to the hiring officer that you wanted to reach. And it's, it's that kind of spirit I think people have to bring to this election uh, process. Um, re reminding ourselves that, you know, we often get um, caught up with the rights that we have as American citizens, which are sacrosanct and, and hugely important, but there's a responsibility too. And part of that responsibility uh, it, it comes into play in this election season where you have to make sure that you and those you care about, those people in your network, are prepared and act early uh, to make sure that your vote counts. How worried do you think people need to be about the slowdowns in the uh, U.S. Postal Service? Uh, we, we did have a former postmaster general of the U.S. Uh, in an earlier segment of this uh, series, and he had no doubts about the ability of the Postal Service to uh, deliver, and he uh, might have been you talking about security, that there simply is no evidence of fraud. Uh, in the uh, history of past elections that would uh, suggest that's a big concern. But that was before everything yeah. started to slow down. How yeah. do you size that up? Yeah. Well, uh, I would, uh, you know, take whatever estimate you might have had before about how long it takes a letter to get where it needs to go. And maybe just for peace of mind, double it. And, and that's the estimate that you should use in, uh, in giving the post office enough time to deliver your ballot. You know, I don't have um, doubt about their capabilities. You know, they certainly deliver our holiday gifts and our birthday cards uh, uh, reliably and, and on time. But look, if, if you're anxious, just increase your margin of, of safety and get it in the mail sooner. And by the way, I should point out, as of now, as of now, 
uh, most counties uh, provide other uh, options for uh, depositing your ballot. Uh, drop boxes, which I know existed in about 20 or 25 counties in Pennsylvania, meaning a secured monitored location where you can go and uh, literally bypass the post office and deliver it in a box that's collected by election officials. And then we also have this, this curious notion of in-person voting by mail, which means that you could go to your county office standing there and you request a ballot, they give you the, a mail ballot, they give it to you, you fill it out and you turn it back into them again while you're standing there. So it is early voting, uh, it just happens to involve a mail ballot. So I, I just say those are likely the choices that most Pennsylvanians will have heading into the uh, November election. So the other answer about if you're overly anxious about the post office, there's some safety valves uh, that you can take advantage of. It does the uh, legitimacy of the use of ballot uh, boxes, drop-off boxes, uh, continue to be the subject of litigation in the state? Well, yeah. Uh, and, and I could take up the next hour trying to detail all of the swirling litigation that's out there. I just say about drop boxes, is there a well-established practice in those states that have been voting by mail for a long time? The state of Colorado uh, has close to 400 drop boxes around the, the, com the, 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 the state uh, that, that people find very popular. In Colorado and in most states that vote primarily by mail or with a mail ballot, over half the people use a drop box location instead of the post office. So this is not revolutionary. This is not uh, unprecedented. Uh, there are well-established security protocols uh, around that. It will require each county to follow those protocols, um, but uh, I just wanna give folks confidence that this is not some cockamamie scheme that exists only in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania that uh, we're gonna kind of uh, uh, freelance uh, and, and do the best. It's, it's got a well-established track record in other states. Well, let's shift gears a little bit uh, in the time we've got left and, and talk about redistricting. Uh, I know that this is an issue that is near and dear to your heart uh, and ties into ensuring that the impact of a one vote is a, about equal to the impact of another vote. Can you talk a bit about that? Sure. Uh, this is a, uh, an issue that, against all odds, has really uh, found its way into the public's uh, consciousness these last few years. And the negative version is gerrymandering, uh, attributable to uh, former Massachusetts Governor Eldridge Gary, uh, who was tarred with that name once he practiced the art. And gerrymandering is essentially manipulating election districts for partisan advantage or incumbent advantage. So drawing the maps has an enormous amount of power. You can carve in those voters and carve out these voters all to benefit your, uh, your own political fortunes. And it's a practice long established in this country, long established in Pennsylvania. And our group decided three or four years ago that it's time, uh, if, if it ever served a useful purpose, it was, uh, it's time had come uh, to put that to an end. And um, you mentioned earlier, uh, I've been active in this in a couple of roles. One is I, I served as chair of the, uh, the Pennsylvania Redistricting Reform Commission, appointed by Governor War, uh, Wolf with a, a bipartisan group of dedicated uh, 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 commissioners. And we took our time and traveled the highways and byways of Pennsylvania to try to figure out what Pennsylvanians thought about that issue and, and delivered, I thought, a first-class report last Labor Day, Labor Day of 2019, to the governor, which I think is, is has really made an impact on the process. The other thing is the Draw the Lines PA project that we've sponsored and stood up. And this is based on a simple proposition that everyone in the Commonwealth should have the ability uh, to exercise their voice and it, it, on the question of drawing political maps. So with the help of uh, some great foundations, including those uh, some in, in Pittsburgh, we raised money 
and created a digital tool uh, and distributed that widely and broadly across Pennsylvania uh, that allowed people to draw their own congressional and legislative maps. And we turned that into a competition. We ended up getting about 6,000 uh, people in the Commonwealth engaged in that process. And again, to make a simple point that the people, it, one of the things it says about redistricting is nobody really cares about it. It's kind of an insider's issue and you know it's not what's on people's minds. Well, we can now say there are 6,000 people out there that spent a few hours actually struggling with how Pennsylvanians should be represented in, in their congressional and legislative districts. And this is all gonna come to a head next year when uh, by mandate of the constitution, we have to redraw uh, political maps and Pennsylvania will uh, will lose a congressional district because of our relatively declining population. So it's going to be a hugely important process. And, and my hope and expectation is the work of the commission and Draw the Lines PA uh, and those uh, 6,000 Pennsylvanians uh, will have a very active role in making sure that we can get the best, fairest maps possible out of that process. And of course, the process of redistricting or the processes of redistricting, because they're two separate processes, uh, affect both the uh, district lines for representatives in Congress, uh, but also the districts from which all of the members of the General Assembly uh, are right. elected. Uh, and we probably should note that Pennsylvania stands in a uh, distinctive position in terms of the underlying law, uh, because the Pennsylvania Supreme Court uh, did decide as a matter of state constitutional law uh, a couple of years ago that the lines that had been drawn uh, could not be uh, accepted. Uh, and so in most states, the challenges that have been made to gerrymandering uh, have been made under federal constitutional law. And the U.S. Supreme Court has been inclined to back away from them. Uh, but in Pennsylvania, that has not been the case. Yeah. So it will be an interesting time. Yeah. And, and uh, uh, that's well said by a, a, a guy who must have spent some time as a dean of a law school. Uh, but, you know, there's a lot of controversy around that Supreme Court decision. Um, and uh, I would happen to agree with those who say that we don't want the courts drawing our maps. My response is we also don't want an, an inside cabal of self-interested politicians drawing their own maps. So how about if we make it possible for a transparent and engaging process in which the citizens of Pennsylvania get to weigh in on the maps for the districts that uh, that will actually uh, be their districts. So um, uh, lots, lots more activity over the last year around that critical issue. Well, an interesting family sidebar, I think, is that while David and Dick Thornburg are, uh, have committed their lives to good government uh, and to advancing mainly the same values, I think did take a somewhat different position with respect to the uh, opinion that was rendered by the Pennsylvania Supreme Court, uh, and still are on fairly friendly terms, I think. <laughs> I think we largely see it eye to eye, but I think, I think my dad and I agree that it's, it's not, we, we don't want the courts drawing our maps. That's, that's not the way the process was intended. Well, this has been a great conversation, and I'd like to uh, leave our viewers and listeners with uh, two thoughts. Uh, they might be viewed as two admonitions from the past. Uh, the first came from Susan B. Anthony, who said, someone struggled for your right to vote, use it. Uh, and Thomas Jefferson said, we do not have uh, government by the majority. Uh, we have government by the majority of those who participate. Uh, 
Uh, and so I know that David and I would stand shoulder to shoulder uh, in urging everyone within the sound of our voices uh, to take advantage of the opportunities that still exist, as he said, uh, to register to vote, uh, to request a mail-in ballot, if that is going to be the most convenient way for you to vote, uh, and to act like it really matters by getting things done early. Because it does really matter. And we've seen so many elections decided by really razor-thin margins when you look at the total number of votes being cast, uh, that everybody is in a position to make a difference. Yeah. To well that, don't you, David? Well said, absolutely. I'm, I'm with you 100%. And uh, great words from Susan B. Anthony and from uh, Thomas Jefferson. Uh, I also slip in before we conclude uh, two critical sources of information. One is the state's website, votespa.com. Um, and the other is uh, the Committee of 70 website, which is uh, the word70.org. So uh, either one uh, is, is a great source of uh, of what voters need to, to know in order to vote uh, safely and securely and to make sure their vote counts this year. So thank you again for this, uh, the privilege of being with you and uh, for your leadership. And um, uh, let's just uh, do what we need to do between now and November 3rd, and uh, then we'll let the chips fall where they may. Well, it's uh, <clears throat> great to have you as involved as you are uh, we appreciate your participating in this program. Uh, I should also say that uh, our next program, which will be uh, released next week, uh, features a friend of David's, uh, Chuck Rosenberg, who built really an extraordinary record uh, in federal law enforcement, uh, and who, in my judgment, is one of the most uh, thoughtful legal analysts in the country. Uh, he will be with us and his topic will be uh, the rule of law in the United States Department of Justice. Uh, so we hope to see you for that program as well. And thanks again to David Thornburg. Thank you, Mark.